Desiree. Hi, Lance. Good morning, Good. Lance. This is going to be the best part of your day. I don't know what you have planned for the rest of your day, but I think this will be the best part of your day. It already is. Right on. I suspect a number of us had some head injuries over the last night. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Christopher, sorry about that. Uh. I appreciate your time, Mr. Wilbur, on a Friday. All right, it is 10 o'clock now, so let's go ahead and get started. The recording is on. I'm going to go ahead and call this uh, work session to order on general obligation bond propositions, AO 2021-3 through 2021-6, AO 2021-8, and 2021-9. Let's go ahead and start with a roll call, please. Yes, Mr. Chair. Ms. Allard. Mr. Constant. Here. Mr. Dunbar. Here. Ms. Kennedy. Ms. LaFrance. Here. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Perez Verdia. Here. Mr. Rivera. Present. Mr. Weddleton. Here. And Ms. Zalatel. Here. Thank you. As normal, if folks want to get in the queue, please put yourself in the chat or text me if you can't access the chat. Just a little bit of introduction before I turn it over to the administration. <clears throat> As members will remember, we did a lot of the work on um, these bonds when we passed the general government operating budget in November. Um, this is a last opportunity, uh, hopefully last, before we vote on the bond packages on the 26th. Um, as a reminder, if any members are preparing amendments, um, those uh, amendments need to have a thorough process both with the assembly. Uh, I don't want to have any amendments on the floor, um, but also with our bond council. So um, those should all be well thought out and planned well in advance of the 26th. With that, um, if we do have amendments, I will likely be calling another work session so that we could review those um, next Friday. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to the administration uh, to do the presentation. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lance Wilbur. I'm the director of the Office of Management and Budget, and today we're going to talk about the proposed bonds. And Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, um, a lot of the projects that we're going to talk about were approved in the capital program. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, so stand by for just a moment. And then and then before you begin, I see that Mr. Constance in the queue. Yeah, it's just in relationship to the conversation about amendments, and I was curious if Mr. Wilbur had heard about a request that I submitted yesterday, and if so, I'd love to hear it in the context of the presentation. If not, I, I can wait. Um, through the chair, Mr. Constant, I believe, uh, was that regarding the library? Yes. Um, we can talk about that uh, when we get into the area-wide facilities bonds, if that works for you. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, you, I sent Desiree a copy of the slide, so this slide presentation will be available online. And um, I'm going to kind of walk through the presentation similar to the effort that we've done in the past. And so I really, again, appreciate your time. So to start with, um, let's see. Sorry about the box at the top. I don't know if you can see that or if it's just on my screen. The proposed 21 general obligation bonds um, for the April ballot are at almost $60 million, $59.58 million. Now, since we've approved the capital improvement budget, um, 
the administration had worked on some projects that the assembly had asked about. We also took a look at some requests that we received from Girdwood after the capital program was approved by the assembly. And then we also considered whether or not we wanted to make some adjustments for uh, another bond for police fleet. So the proposals on the uh, before you today would require, if approved, um, some amendments to the capital improvement program to incorporate these proposed changes that the administration is going to share today. And I'll highlight those um, to start with. We have, as Mr. Chairman mentioned, we have six ordinances in front of you for six ballot measures going forward for parks and recreation, fire. We have an area wide public safety and transit bond. That one has a star next to it. And then you'll see area wide facilities, arts and police. Each of those bonds, um, as they were presented to the assembly, include the proposed changes that the administration would like to make. Um, and I will talk about each one of those on a separate slide. So as you are taking action on these proposed ballot measures, your action of approval will um, concurrently amend the capital improvement program or budget so that they are consistent. So before I get started, I think one of the things that's um, important to point out is kind of how have we been doing in the past? And I, in the past, we've shown a slide is, you know, what has been the amount of GO bonds that we've issued? And again, general obligation bonds, these are separate from the bonds that would be issued from the school district, which are also general obligation bonds, but not for general government. And these would be separate from any bonds that might be issued for capital improvements at the port or solid waste or any place else, one of our utilities or enterprises. This is just general government. You can see sort of a trend, um, and I, I, I asked public finance, and thanks to Alex and his team for helping me put this information together. But we, we basically go back 30 years, and you can see how much bond we're asking the voters to approve or at least consider what that dollar amount would be in today's dollars and then the amount of the, the population show comparison of what the adding debt would be. And while I was looking at this, I was, uh, you know, noticing the changes primarily in the last 10 years. And while we've presented the capital program, I think um, Chief of Staff Mr. Bakkenstead noted to the assembly as some information, you know, one of the things that's changed in Anchorage over the last um, probably 12 to 15 years is the amount of state dollars that have come to the municipality for capital improvements. It's gone down to almost none. Um, and in the, you know, in the past five or six years, we've gotten about $2.5 million in capital pro and dollars from the state. Two million of that was from for the police department. And about half a million dollars was some state grants we got to pay the light bill on the utility poles for a state road out on Jewel Lake Road. We received some money from the state on the on um, from the port in the last uh, five or six years. But suffice it to say, literally all of the capital investment that's occurred, whether it's in parks or roads, primarily in the roads or our facilities, has really come from. Um, our local dollars and without our investments, the rest of our infrastructure would really, really be falling behind. So in the last six years, it's gone down. But during that period in 2011, I think the municipality, we received, uh, I, I think it was, a, uh, I think roughly about a hundred million dollars in the, in the, in 2009, or 2011 to 2000 or 2014 to 2009 roughly we got 400 million dollars in general obligation not including the 100 million we got for the port so really um you know in a time when we were not bonding for a lot we were receiving tens almost a hundred hundreds of millions of dollars in capital improvements so um, that's, I think, a sign of the, uh, an illustration of the, the changes in the way that um, the, the communities had to step up and invest in, in our um, 
in our infrastructure. So I, I think these are informa that information is important to tell. And then, but during that time and primarily recently, you know, through a couple things, one, the general market of how our bonds and our investments are occurring, interest rates are down significantly. And when we put together our ballot propositions, we, we make, uh, I think, a conservative assumption on what the rate is that we will be paying on the bonds that we issue. And traditionally, the amount that we actually pay is a little bit less, but um, I think it, it's wise to be a little bit conservative when we're presenting to the voters on um, what will the cost of this debt actually be to pay it back. But two things, good news. One is the interest rates continue to go down or at least stay stable and the time to invest is really continually to be, um, we're in really good shape. So. Um, uh, I think it's a good story here um, on how much we are investing. The, um, uh, the ability to invest more and continue to hold our AAA and our AA bond rating, we could certainly do that um, and maintain those ratings. However, the administration has uh, decided to basically say, look, um, while the interest might be favorable, you know, given the economic times most currently this year due to COVID and a variety of other things, does it make a lot of sense to, to go much more than this and really focus and target on the key infrastructure and the key needs that we want to make. And that is what was in the capital improvement program. And that is what we want to show on the 2021 bond to the voters. So, and Mr. Chairman, I'm going to, um, I'll let uh, how you want to manage the work session. I welcome questions as we go or we can, um, when we get to the end, I'll be uh, address them, so. Thank you, I'll take questions slide by slide. Um, uh, so I wanna note for the record, we've been joined by Ms. Kennedy, and then I have a question from Ms. Alito. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Wilbur, the C's, the Statement of Economic, uh, my brain just stopped, but the C's, uh -huh. um, economic effect, thank you, um, show 4% for the bonds. And we're, we're talking here about maybe some, so that's the conservative um, yes. estimate. So what, what are we, what, what are we currently kind of for interest rates, just to put some context into how conservative we're being? Um, I'm going to let Mr. Slifka jump on. Uh, I don't want to state it inaccurately. So Alex, are you online? I am, and thank you through the chair. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Zalto forwarded the question to us, and um, the answer is in the most recent debt offering that we completed late in 2020, the interest rate was uh, at a historic low of 1.76%. Um, that is a long way from 4%, uh, so um, I, I think what we have decided to do going forward uh, is to put an estimate on the C's that are 50% above uh, what our most recent offering would be. So, you know, that would mean that instead of assuming 4%, we would assume 2.5%. Um, and uh, the logic behind it is better to be conservative and uh, deliver debt service less than people expect than to be a bit too precise. And then if interest rates move against you, uh, you end up with a debt service rate that's higher. Um, but uh, it, we have every reason to expect that, you know, we should be able to continue to issue bonds in the somewhere between one and three quarters and two and a half percent range for the, at least uh, for 2021, unless something dramatic changes. Thank you. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the next slide here, um, I mentioned some of these points here. You know, we continue to have those. Uh, I think it's important to reiterate. You know, the, the rates that we have that Mr. Slifka just noted we continue to be very low. And what you'll see here on the graph on the right is the balances of our general obligation bonds over over the last um, seven years, or at least projected into 21. And I think that this is also. I think we our 21 proposal is actually a little bit under our average. Our average over that amount of time is about 418 million has been our debt balance. So in 21, we're slightly under the average 
that we've been since 2015. So, and again, appreciate the work that having a good bond rating lowers our cost of projects and frankly we are allowed to do more with the money that we have so maintaining a good bond rating is good for a lot of things so that's uh, i just wanted to share that so i think where i want to go to next is I, actually I, mr wilbur before you continue i have a question from miss kennedy yes miss kennedy uh thank you thank you mr chair and mr wilbur um i guess my question is a little bit more in uh, align with um the bond market itself and i was just curious as to what happens with the the appetite for purchasing bonds when the when the bond market when the interest rate for the bond market is so low um so a little bit of an opinion on that um just in terms of can will we actually be able to sell bonds when when the interest rates are so low and then the other part of that is when the interest rates are so low are, are there actually more restrictions or more requirements uh, in terms of how long those bonds have to be held for? Um, anyway, so just a little bit more of a, of a conversation about how the interest rates actually affect the bond market itself and what kinds of requirements and restrictions uh, might change and that we would then be held to that we maybe wouldn't be if it were a higher interest rate. So thank you. Uh, so through the chair, Alex Lifka, I'll answer both of those. One, it, it really works that uh, interest rates are set by supply and demand, uh, and interest rates are low around the globe. In fact, while they are positive in the U.S., there are broad areas uh, in Europe where interest rates are actually negative. Um, so that interest rates are at one and three quarters percent, or if they go to one percent, uh, that won't impact our ability to sell all the bonds that we want. In the market we have today, U.S. Treasury is issuing trillions of dollars of debt at rates below even what we're offering our, our uh, securities for. So uh, the level of rate, uh, interest rate has no bearing absolutely on the level of demand. Um, the second question is that that we have routinely offered our bonds with a structure of, of being 20 years for geo debt with 10 years of call protection. Um, and we don't, do not have any um, metrics uh, that are required of us uh, in terms of those bonds. And I would point as a distinction when we issue revenue bonds, such as the revenue bonds that we recently issued for the port, and as we are most likely going to be issuing later on this year for um, the solid waste, revenue bonds do have uh, uh, debt service requirements that you know the entity needs to have net income generally about 1.2 times the debt service requirement, um, but that's only for revenue bonds and it is not ever the case for general obligation bonds. So I'll stop there. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, please continue. Okay, so I mentioned that um, in the, when we presented the 2021 capital improvement budget and the 21 bonds, we did have some changes and I just want to highlight some of those changes and, and talk briefly about why these changes were made. So um, one of the things that we had done initially when we put out the um, capital improvement program, we, we have um, we take a look at the bond eligibility and whether or not these projects um, can continue to stay on or whether or not there's um, now a better opportunity potentially to make some changes. So in the area wide facilities, uh, I guess category of projects. One of the projects we had in there was some improvements to the Anchorage Memorial Cemetery to uh, shore up some work at the Columbarium Wall to address some perimeter fencing, also help with the markers and do some adjustments there. You know, with making the change for Parks and Rec moving from health over to, or the cemetery moving from the health department to Parks and Recreation and in conversations with Alan Chikowski at facilities, I think we can start 
working away at some of those in, uh, with the team at Parks and Recreation. So we're going to recommend that we don't put that one on there. It had been on the bond previously um, a couple years ago uh, that did not pass. So the administration is going to uh, re request that we take this $350,000 off the facilities bond. The other thing that we discovered is one of the projects we had was to do some remediation on some underground storage tanks at a, um, in Anchorage. And what we found out from bond council is that remediation is not a bond eligible expense. So we're recommending that that be removed. We also had a little bit of change in one of the projects had some um, flooring or tile work as part of a capital facilities. So we reduced that amount by about $70,000. And then the assembly in an amendment process and then finally approved added public restroom as a project and we'll talk, uh, talk a little bit more about that one. But one of the adjustments that we made and it was based on a comment that I made at the at the assembly is the original proposal was for about $250,000 and we wanted to take a little closer look at that and then talk to some other jurisdictions and then propose whether or not we needed some operation and maintenance dollars in there. And we are going to propose to make that change. It would be adding about $75,000 to this project. Um, and while the, the public restroom facility itself is pretty close to about 250, maybe a little bit less than that, there's a lot of uh, utility work that we need to include when we're putting that. There's some design work that's going to be required and, and location set up. And so working with project management and engineering, we'd recommend that we up that a little bit and then hopefully we can get a public restroom, uh, assuming the bonds passed, installed this year. So that's the changes in the area-wide facilities. On the public safety, um, we have a public safety and area-wide transit. Um, one of the projects that we uh, had heard from Girdwood after the capital improvement program was approved is we got a letter from the Girdwood Board of Supervisors. We heard from Chief Weston down in Girdwood that um, Rescue 41 needs uh, needs to be replaced, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, when I get to that part. But we're going to recommend adding that in the roads. We're, um, we have done, I believe, in the past, we've bonded for some heavy equipment. In this particular case, it's related to front end loaders and street sweepers. So we want to add that to the road bond. Those uh, help keep our roads, our investment, up to date, and then. While we were building the capital program, we were uh, considering whether or not we wanted to put a another bond out for APD fleet with a review with Alan and Chief Dahl. You know, it does make a lot of sense to try to show some investments in our APD fleet. They're, I think, roughly 65 percent uh, percent of their fleet is to depreciation, and so we need to get them shored back up again. I will touch base with that again, and then. Uh, also, in the Girdwood area, um, last year, the and as proposed again this year, the, Girdwood had proposed to bond $2.1 million for Glacier City Hall Little Bears. We had a follow-up request from the Girdwood Board of Supervisors in December asking that we delay that project. They're looking at whether or not they want to scope it differently. Um, so we're honoring their request and we're, we're going to postpone that. Uh, on the bond so there would not be a separate bond for Girdwood. So those are the highlights of the changes and the, again the uh, ordinances that we propose to you include all of these changes and I, as I go through each one of the bonds a little bit more if you have questions we can jump into them then. Okay so I'm going to go ahead and start we're looking through the projects, but one of the things I want to talk about is some of the successes that I think that uh, departments have had with this, uh, you know, our engineering community and certainly our construction community, pulling some projects together. And I asked project management, engineering, parks, and other departments to give us some examples of when we put bonds out on the street or we ask voters, what are we doing with them? And I, I, these, some of these projects should sound very familiar. But these are the projects that were completed with the work of the 2020 bonds. So it shows that if we can get the voters to support us, then we can actually do work. So um, 
this is Arctic. The one on the top right is uh, Chester Creek at Arctic Boulevards. This is down by Valley of the Moon Park. We had some over the past. We had a lot of drainage and flooding at times when we had high water or ice build up. So really great project going on there. And then at Campbell Woods um, over in South Anchorage, you can see that some of these roads were built probably to substandard or their base was really in poor shape. Go back in and, and make some genuine improvements to the to the neighborhood. And then Pleasant Valley out in East Anchorage area, you can see that we've bonded for some improvements there. And then a couple, a couple pictures of the road improvement, the culvert replacement that we had at um, Northern Lights Boulevard. Again, this was sort of an emergency repair and um, really our contractor stepped up, PM&E put together a design team and a construction team to pull that thing off. And um, if, we, if our time permits, I have a little uh, show that I'd like to share with you on that one. So really some success in 2020 with our capital work. And continuing over in traffic engineering, our traffic calming program and safety improvements, we have those and continue in 2021. You can see some examples there. Our Fourth Avenue signals and lighting downtown with project management engineering, traffic, and a little bit, I think, work with the state. We are able to make some improvements there. We're going to continue those. And some examples here, there's one in the center bottom the new bus stop at C and 7th, which um, shelters aren't showing in here, but work to be done there thanks to um, transit and uh, the folks out of pm and &E to pulling that one off. And then again, a little bit more speed pump. So a variety of projects that were completed in the Artsa uh, road last year. And so with that, I want to kind of show you some of the projects that we're really showing in 2021. The Arts of Bond for 2021 is $36.425 million in total. It's a little, I think it's right around 40 projects in total. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of these. Image and reflection. Again, these are streets, neighborhood streets that have a lot of drainage problems. The pavement is failing and the pedestrian facilities are um, either need and need repair or they have gaps. So we're going to continue to do some work um, in that neighborhood. I mentioned the downtown lighting and signal upgrades. Um, we have a lot of our signal, the poles, the bases, the uh, conduit, the wires. A lot of work needs to be done there. It's a multi-year project. And here's some examples of uh, some of the work that needs to be done. These facilities have been in the ground for 20 to 30 years and just a combination of the environment and the weather and the, uh, the salt and sand really kind of takes its toll. So looking to make some improvements there. Mountain View Drive, this is would be a surface rehabilitation in Mountain View Drive. Um, and you can see that we'll also include some drainage improvements, pavements on Mountain View Drive. And then 15th Avenue, last year 15th Avenue um, we had on the bond, but we delayed it in order to step in and do the Northern Lights Boulevard Park project. So this one is um, we had originally planned to do last year, but decided to hold off. Again, this is a, another significant pavement rehabilitation project on, um, on 15th Avenue that we're looking to get done. Let's see a couple other examples. So West 33rd, so, um, this is you know, really looking from about Arctic Boulevard, moving from the west side going east towards the old Seward Highway. This is a, this is the section that would be the most western end, and you can see the existing condition of the street in the top in the top left, and then a schematic of what we're looking at as a concept on how we might be able to make those improvements. Again, this project will be done in pieces. And we'll again start on the west, and the idea is to make it look a, something like what you see in the top right. A couple other key projects: bond, our boundary surface rehab. Again, this one's got a, a lot of patches, uh, some broken curbs in there that we need to get fixed. And then Titia Circle. This is over in the Jewel Lake area, Sand Lake area. Um, a lot of this is similar to Campbell Woods, where the sub base and the it's just really kind of failing from the bottom up. 
and um, our street maintenance team struggles with this. And then obviously homeowners, there they have uh, you know, ponding and drainage concerns on the street. And the more it gets, the worse it gets, the, the worse the drainage and the ponding, and, and it just the road just gets tore up really quick. One of the other things we do is we do strain, uh, storm drain and improvements. We have an annual program in there. Obviously, we have um, uh, hundreds of miles of uh, storm drain that we're that we need to complete and fix. And so this is just a simple example where we're either replacing what's going under, or just frankly, maybe it might be something as simple as where the storm drain inlet is or the cover to the access. We need to make some improvements there. So. Those are just some examples of the roadway projects. Again, this is a $36 million roadway bond, and those are just some examples of projects. I've got some folks from PM&E online, um, Russ Oswald and Gary Jones. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if there are specific questions, we can try to do that now, or if assembly members, as they review the list again, and you have detailed questions, please let us know and we'll um, help you get the answers you need either for this purpose or to respond to your councils. So I'm gonna hold it there before I move on to parks. Thank you. Don't see any questions right now, um, but we'll, we'll see at the end if there are any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So similarly to um, parks and uh, to the roadway, I think you know it's worth showing the work uh, that some of these pictures, frankly, probably would look a little familiar. Um, last year, um, Parks and Recreation is working to improve Campbell Creek Trail. They, they started in about 2017 and down by um, the Arctic Sea Street area, and they progressed north. And you know, here's an example of some of the improvements that they um, are making. The top photos, what, what we started with in probably 2019 and early 2020, and then the bottom photo show what, um, what a work had been accomplished in 2020. And to the right, we had some improvements in the far north Bicentennial Park. And the Youth Employment and Parks program that uh, Josh and the po folks at Parks and Rec would work with, you know, they, they also get some federal support on some of these projects, but I think Parks and Recreation does an amazing job, um, you know, pulling together a variety of resources, not just the local dollars to support these, but also, you know, bringing in nonprofits to support uh, parks and trail upgrades. And here's a simple example where the Youth Employment Parks was working and then a finished product off onto the far right. So another, you know, you, we get the resources to do work we can do it and, and pull it off, So, which I think is great. We don't want to be asking the voters for dollars and then having it parked. If we're going to ask them for a vote, I mean, we have to have some design money, but there's just some examples of some construction. The uh, Into the top uh, top left, you this little graphic, might you might remember this one. This was a graphic we used to show you, hey, if we can get the park spawns passed next year, we're going to do, and this is a schematic of what Jewel Lake Park, it, kind of a pirate ship or kind of an approach, and they, they completed that project here is uh, on the bottom on the bottom right. You show the, the job done and some folks, some young children out enjoying the, the new the new park improvements out at Jewel Lake. So and Josh and his crew and the design team and putting that stuff together, you know, this is not, you pull it off the shelf. I think they did an amazing job. Over in uh, downtown, this is a picture of Frontier Land Park. Obviously, this one's under construction. So this is over at 10th and, I think that's 10th and E, or no, 10th and, 10th and uh, D Street, I believe it is. 10th and E Street. So, um, Anyway, this one here is under winter shutdown, but they did all the concrete work and uh, they'll be finishing that up next uh, next spring when, or this coming spring when we're able to open that back up. And so a lot of a lot of work going on um, in the parks and rec world and I think we get a lot of projects being completed in parks and recreation. So as I mentioned, when we look forward to 2021, the bond amount that we're looking to ask the voters is 3.95 million. It's the same amount that we've asked for the last couple years. And again, it's a blend of park improvements, 
trail improvements, a little bit of facility improvements inside the park service area. So I think Josh and, and his crew have a, a lot of good work going on. I won't be able to show them all. I think they have like 13 or 14 projects going on. But here's an example, the Campbell Creek Trail, just as a reminder, I mentioned in the in the on the left, you can see that they started in 2017 and they're just working their way up. And the focus of the 21 bond is on phase five, which is it would basically be between uh, it's just south of International Airport Road, just west of the Old Seward Highway. And um, so just sort of south of the peanut farm along the Old Seward Highway and just south of uh, Dowling. And you'll see some trail realignment, some new bridges coming in. Um, obviously, we're getting uh, the street. The stream is starting to meander to undercut the trail. So the smart thing to do is uh, do some realignment and then obviously make some improvements to connections to the neighborhood. So that's the, a, a piece of the Campbell Creek Trail that's going to be done. And obviously next year, if we're successful, we'll continue to go north and make improvements over through um, up to the Old Seward Highway. So that's one project we're looking for 21. Another one, a couple project examples here, some athletic fields. Um, Josh and his team have been working to make some improvements on our athletic fields. In the past, we've done some ADA improvements. We've done some um, safety and code upgrades. This year, we're looking to make some improvements out at Russian Jack and then um, make some, and I think uh, this picture on the top at car -T is an example of a finished product some work that's been done in the past. So our softball fields get a lot of work and, and we've got a, 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 they get a lot of use. And so it's great that we can invest there. And then to the right is a project. It's uh, basically a, a, it's not a BMX or bike park in South Anchorage. The gray, uh, what you'll see is, this is a picture of the South Anchorage Sports Park, which is south of uh, Minnesota, west of Clatt, um, <clears throat> or west of C Street, north of Clatt Road down here. So this gray area is where we'll be doing, or these gray areas will be doing the improvements. Here's some examples of what the uh, vision is for that, um, that park. It'd be for all ages. And, and here's some examples from, I think a couple of these are from uh, bike parks in Colorado and a couple in maybe one or two in Arizona. I can't remember where the other one was, but really uh, an asset that we don't currently have inside Anchorage and a, a good location with easy access for folks to use. So that would be a great project if we could get that one done. And then a last couple I want to mention on the parks is Parks and Recreation. We have three projects that we're going to leverage federal dollars with. One of them is a Fish Creek Trail connection to the ocean and uh, to the left is basically connecting Northern Lights Boulevard along basically the railroad just west of Forest Park and then it would connect down somewhere over to the coastal trail. The other project that we have would be in the top right is the Northeast Connector. This would connect um, basically where Campbell Airstrip Road connects and it would go south of Tudor Road and go all the way over to um, Regal Mountain Air Drive in um, Chugach Foothills, or excuse me, in the, around the Tudor Muldoon Curve. Again, these are 10 to 20 percent matches uh, for these projects. And then the last one on the bottom here is a connection to the Coastal Trail to Ship Creek. This picture is taken pretty much right near where Elderberry Park goes. So we basically similarly follow the coastline as we've done in the past and it would come out near the Ship Creek boat launch is the concept there. So again, uh, this is leveraging um, a 10 to one on our dollars with local money. So I think a, a well-rounded list of bond projects for the, road, or for the trails. And the, I'm gonna move on to um, I think facilities next, Mr. Chairman, if there's no questions on the parks. Thanks. I don't see any questions. Thank you. Oh, so the next group I mentioned is the area. So we have another bond. It's area wide public facilities and um, a transit bond. Um, I think uh, for those who may be listening or maybe some new members, uh, you know, we have some work that we do that's area wide. It goes all the way from 
Chugiak, Akluta, all the way down to Girdwood. And those include services like ambulance service or EMS service, um, our uh, weather and then uh, school zone safety improvements. So we have, we have some projects that are area wide and others are in service areas. So some of the projects as a reminder, the AWARN system, that's a, uh, a system of communication that ties all of our first responders and general government in the event that we are facing an emergency where we need to communicate with other jurisdictions. Um, we're allowed to do that. And, um, as I mentioned previously, this allows us to work. You know, we can, in the event of a disaster, our AWARN system allows us to connect rate with radios to all other jurisdictions some other jurisdictions. I did mention uh, Rescue 41. I think after we talked about this one, one of the things that Rescue 41 does, it, 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 is, an, it is a piece of equipment that runs out of Girdwood and it's about 20 years old and roughly 90% or 96% of the calls that that apparatus responds to are along um, uh, the Seward Highway from milepost 75 to 105, really responding to accidents. It's really for the first piece of equipment that's on scene in the event that we have um, motor vehicle accidents. Typically, they're at high speed crashes, and, and these guys are this piece of equipment is the one that's used to extricate individuals out of these vehicles. It's it's really uh, the, the, the piece that supports our EMS services. You know, and it is pretty much on scene for all of those and the via and the apparatus that's called. The next post closest piece of equipment is, I believe, at Fire Station 4, which is the next sort of rescue piece of equipment. And in the event that we have to rely on that piece of equipment to respond, they're 35 to 40 minutes or 50 minutes away, depending on where the incident occurs. So, you know, we had some conversations with our legal folks and had some conversations with Chief Weston and Chief Hetrick really think this is a, a really good idea to replace this piece of equipment, um, show it in an area wide public safety bond because it's you know, primary purpose is in support of our EMS services along that highway. And it seems reasonable that we ask the area wide folks to support that rather than just the folks in Girdwood when this piece of apparatus is frankly serving the broader residents of, of Anchorage. So we uh, we thought that was a really good idea. So we're asking that we add 870,000. It takes a little while to order and receive one of these things. And uh, the equipment on Rescue 41 likewise is, it's mostly 20 plus years old. So the support equipment on there, they would be great if we could get the voters to approve that and replace that uh, piece of equipment. Fire department also has a fire truck down there, and obviously that one is working to support primarily response to the Girdwood area. And those folks, uh, the Girdwood Board of Supervisors and the residents of Girdwood are looking to replace that in a different manner, but the folks in Girdwood we, would be replacing the fire truck or the fire engine. But this rescue piece of equipment, um, this is new. So this one here we're adding to the public safety bond. And, the other one that we have, it's not an addition, but we have three ambulances and frankly, uh, Chief Hetrick over time and uh, we've been working and I've mentioned this, they're in the process of replacing the chassis that need to and then uh, replacing the ambulances, but we're basically going to be buying chassis and um, putting the boxes that we have on the new chassis. This one would do one brand new complete ambulance and then two new chassis. So we're just replacing the chassis on a couple ambulances. And so this is a really good uh, investment here. We're not throwing away the entire thing or auctioning the entire thing. We're going to keep the boxes. They last a little bit longer. And then um, in public transportation in, in Jamie's arena, obviously we're we'll continue to match programs. She's, um, you know, looking to start doing a bus buy with some of these dollars here and making some transit improvements. Her fleet that she's looking to replace is, I think, over 10, I think 12 years old, and over half a million miles on some of those vehicles. So that's where a lot of that match is going to come. And then school zone safety improvements. This is an example where we're making improvements at um, 
think this one here is down near uh, Chinook Elementary, but we've got projects lined up at Muldoon Elementary, Inlet View. We've done some work there with the utilities. So a lot of school zone safety projects at four or five different locations around the municipality. So again, the, the one change is Rescue 41. Move on. Before you continue, just want to note for the record, we've been joined by Ms. Allard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm, um, I'm down to the last couple slides, Mr. Chairman. So the next one we have is an area-wide facilities bond um, where we, we, we noted that in the health department, the health department, we are um, the downtown. They're not planning to be relocated in the next couple years. Um, you know, we need, we, so in that event, we've been looking and trying to find a, a, a suitable or at least consider another location for the health department. And, in, and in what we are faced with right now is we need to make some improvements to their heating system. We need to make some uh, safety and code improvements. And so we're asking for the two and a half million dollars to primarily invest in replacing of the boilers and the heat inside that building. You can see on the top uh, or off to the right, this is a copy or this is a picture of the boilers. Alan can jump in uh, if, he, if he needs to, but I think these boilers are 30 plus years old. Um, he sent me a couple other pictures. I, they're manufacturing parts to fix them because they can't find them. Um, and so it's kind of, a, I think it's time that we, we make some changes there. And really we depend on the health department for so much more than, than you know, the, the work that they're doing, we want to make sure that it, while they're in the facility they're in, it maintains the, you know, to be a, a place where that's they can continue to work and that it be safe and that we meet the code upgrades. So that's a change there. We talked about and we have included solar panels. That's not a new project. There's 14 municipal facilities in there. The list of them is in your capital program. I think five or six of them are on um, fire stations. There's a couple of them on the other municipal facilities. So we make some improvements there. There's, um, you know, we're, we did some calculations on the return on investment. So basically with the savings that we have on our utility bills, they'll help us pay off the debt that would be incurred with these. And at the, in the long run, they're, they're a smart investment. We have a list of projects for uh, facilities. Um, a couple of them, we have a roof project over in Russian Jack, not the, uh, at the greenhouse area. We've also um, we've got some improvements over in um, a couple of our other facilities where we're making just code upgrades there. And then the Anchorage and Chugiak Eagle River Senior Centers, we have, uh, there's two projects there. We had a large bond last year, so we're doing some work in the Anchorage area. I think they did some parking lot improvements, um, some other uh, improvements that were completed in 2020. Uh, in the Chugiak Eagle River area last year. Similarly, we did some carport uh, improvements there, some parking lots, some inside improvements. Um, Chugiak Eagle River, the senior center, they would like to start moving forward on an expansion. They have, uh, I think, uh, I think the waiting list is a little over um, 20 to 50 individuals. They would like to add at least 20 units. And so what we're asking the voters to do is support the initial work that's required make sure that the um, the septic and the drainage there have an on-site system to make sure that that is um, at, a, at the appropriate capacity and start the design work and in the capital improvement program you'll see a four million dollar request next year to start uh, advancing the, uh, those apartments and the expansion of the Chugaki River Senior Center um, and then we have uh, the Lusac Library, the Alaska Room. This $500,000 is a match. When we put this together and I received some information, the match money uh, had been received. I think it's a significant amount, at least $200,000. And then they're doing some fundraising that would do a project at the Alaska Room. We also have um, some improvements to pools and then a public restroom. This is an example in the bottom center of uh, a Portland Lou. This is not necessarily the project we would have, but there's plenty of examples um, where these public restrooms have been installed with success. Um, 
there's a lot of different designs to lower the maintenance, improve the safety, to make sure that, um, you know, that they are well maintained and used and a welcome to folks that might want to use those. So anyway, that is the addition there. We added a little bit of O&M to make sure that that project would go forward. So. Thank you. I have a couple questions. Uh, first, Ms. Kennedy. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just in looking over some of this, and particularly with the Chugach Eagle River Senior Center, I was just wondering uh, how much of this is still related to earthquake damage, if, if any. Thank you. I don't believe any, uh, through the chair, Ms. Kennedy, I don't believe any of it is, and here's the reason why. I think those dollars, the earthquake damage, that is eligible. We're, we're looking directly for FEMA. I don't, we're not looking to cover those expenses with the bonds. All right, great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yep. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Zolotel. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Wilbur, on the public restrooms, and maybe this would be a question for Parks and Rec, um, are, is the language in the bond package uh, suitably flexible enough to consider a wide variety of options? Um, and because I guess I was under the impression that we were uh, bonding for public restrooms, plural, but then when I thought I heard you say was this would be one. So I need a little bit of clarification or just want to ensure that we're flexible enough to look at a variety of options. Um, through the chair, the short answer is yes, we do. Um, we are flexible um, to do it. And frankly, it doesn't have to, and to that point, it doesn't even, it doesn't have to be a, a, this particular model or this particular type. Um, the, 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 the comment about how many can we do, frankly, I think the 325 will allow us to properly install one and then start finding the locations where we want to install the next ones. Um, so uh, we don't, $325,000 will not allow us um, to do two public restrooms um, in 2021. It will allow us to do one and then start the process to, to find a location to do another one. So we got to do some legwork. And Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gates, did you want to comment now or at the end of the uh, slides? Um, I wanted to wait to the end of the whole presentation, please. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Constant. Thank you, uh, Lance. I guess this would be the place to talk about the potential of dividing the question. Yes. So do you want me to start as, as I understand it? Yes, please. OK, so um, I received a re received some inf or some information that that um, there has been some interest to actually separate the Lusac Library uh, project and maybe the senior centers. I don't know, but at least the Lusac Library uh, pull that project out and create a separate standalone bond for the five hundred thousand dollars. So we would have two area wide facilities, one for those and then the other for the LUSAC library um, as a separate standalone project. I think the administration had, you know, when we put this together, we had considered whether or not we should have a separate bond. There's a lot of factors at play on why we want to, why we agreed to put them in here. There is no prohibition to doing a separate uh, ballot measure. The, uh, obviously, there's the expense of creating a separate ballot. Um, and the way, and I would yield to legal, because I think I've, uh, the way we would have to do it is the current bond proposal that we have has it all into one. So the ballot proposition has all of the projects in one ballot measure. If the assembly elects to separate them, we would need to edit this, uh, this, met, this one here. And then we would have to create one for the uh, LUSAC library and that principally, if not operationally, what we would have to do. It would not affect the, uh, we wouldn't have to adjust the budget in any way. It's just how we present it to the voters. So I definitely heard from the friends of the library and, and folks from the senior center and they, they definitely expressed interest in having their question divided, but um, so, okay, it is possible is what I heard, and uh, I heard from the chair 
that it needs to be done with enough time. I'm assuming then that I'm going to hear from Dean next about <laughs> if it's possible or not. Thank you, uh, Mr. Weddleton. Mr. Weddleton, you're on mute. OK, we'll go ahead and come back uh, to you, uh, Mr. Gates. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on dividing the question, and I'm not sure if I was clear on uh, how it was described, uh, but I think if I understood um, the talk about editing the ordinance to separate them out to the different bonds, would that be, uh, I guess, Mr. Wilbur was describing that, um, and maybe a question for him, would that be within within the same ordinance? And I don't know, that might be a possibility, but that's a lot of drafting and editing and review. Um, but if it was a separating it out to separate ordinance uh, for approval, uh, it's too late to do that. We can't do that. We would have to introduce these ordinances, introduce at one meeting and uh, public hearing at the next. And we're past that point where we're able to do that to get it on the ballot on time. Since the 26th, then our last day to pass ordinances for the ballot. Um, so if it's within the same ordinance, uh, uh, we will have to have a conversation, I guess, internally about that possibility. And then I guess this is a good point for me to say what I planned to say earlier, which is if there's any amendments to all of these, you know, we need them as soon as possible. I don't think it would be possible for us to make any amendments that are requested, you know, the morning of the 26th or even on the 25th. Um, so, and hopefully there are none. So I guess I would uh, pass to Mr. Wilbur or Mr. Slivka about dividing the question within a single ordinance strongly before as, as an S version. Um, through you. the chair, I'll, I'll start. Um, I really do think it's a, a legal question. I think Mr. Gates brings up an excellent point. If you have the ability to create an S version and as a result of that, sort of split this ballot into two separate measures, um, I mean, we, we have introduced, uh, and I think that's frankly a legal question, the ability to create the ballot, um, I think that we're gonna lean to our um, our friends at Bond Council, I mean, frankly, I don't think it would be that difficult. I just don't know if it's legally doable at this point. I think Mr. Gates brings up a good good point, and I don't have an answer to that, Mr. Chairman. And this is Alex. I'll just add, obviously, since the projects were uh, approved by Bond Council in the original draft, if they were separated, they would be allowed. But uh, I think Lance, uh, Mr. Wilbur, uh, correctly points out the limitation isn't here. The limitation is with your legal process for introducing and passing these ordinances. Thank you. Uh, and at, on the question of amendments, as I've stated before, um, please get your amendments in sooner than later. And if we do have amendments, I will likely be calling a second work session to review those. Um, I think we would and the public would benefit if we review those in advance of the meeting. Uh, Mr. Weddleton, then Mr. Constant, then uh, we need to finish up the presentation. We are almost out of time. Mr. Weddleton. All right, thanks. Uh, the, you know, these public restrooms, I think we really need public restrooms, so I wouldn't argue with that, but that cost is unbelievably high. You could build a house for that. And, you know, if we, we need these, because people have no place to go, and and I just quickly here, you know, if a porta potty is 175 a month, which I don't know if that's true, it just popped into my head that I'd seen that before, then we could do five porta potties for 30 years for $325,000. Um, or if you just do the O&M, you, you could go for several for quite a long time. Uh, how, how do we justify that cost for um, one public toilet? Um, through the chair, um, Mr. Wellington, I think given our time, what I'd like to do is we have a brief breakdown of how we got to this 325 from everything from the cost of this thing to the ship to the shipping to what it would take to you know uh, locate it. And so we'd be glad to share that with you. OK, I'd like to see it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And Mr. Slipka, did you want to respond to this as well? 
I was only going to add the one thing that, that, yes, they're very expensive, but as you look at this, the, the trade off between these and porta potties and or other closed structures, that these are uh, dramatically safer for the user. They reduce any opportunity for uh, bad behavior, um, which is why they are attractive. But uh, I'll let Lance provide the detail. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Yeah, thank you. And I, I think actually Mr. Weddleton, Mr. Dunbar posted into the chat that it's more close to $125 to $150 a day, not a month. And the cost of maintaining them is uh, compounded by uh, repair damage, uh, replacing the portables that get destroyed from fires and other uses that are not positive. And so you're looking at, if you do the math there, about five years of value in the temporary to the permanent and so but that's not my question i want to return back to the divided question um because i don't believe i heard that it's not legally possible what i heard was it's not legally possible to introduce a new ordinance but it could be a substitute ordinance uh, a substitute version that that gets there so dean um, I understand you suggested it would be complex to do that because there's a lots of lines of code to address in that question, but did you say that that wasn't possible? Um, Mr. Gates. For me, yes. Uh, no, I did not say that it's not. I say, I think, okay, the DQ, I think it might be very problematic. It may not be possible. And it's definitely not a good idea. <laughs> um, so we will look at it and need to get back to you. I will be conferring with legal and bond counsel. And uh, like Mr. Wilbur said, it is a legal question. Um, uh, it's going to take a little bit of work. I mean, it's a pretty significant rewriting of the ordinance to do this. Is it something that bond counsel could draft if we all agree that it's legal? Um, you know, uh, I need to talk to legal about that and how that drafting would work. Bond counsel definitely needs to be involved and they're very expensive. So I guess, uh, you know, you need to ask why they're doing it and is it worth this expensive cost? <laughs> so. <clears throat> and, and really, uh, what bond counsel does is, is they, they weigh in on, is this something that we can legally bond for? Uh, they don't wander into the what does our code say about when it has to be introduced and when does it have to be approved no that's no that's so alex that's not the question that we're tackling though when it has to be done that we can take that off the table because nobody is proposing to introduce a new ordinance the conversation we're having is about a, a, a motion to divide the question separating out those two projects from the list and taking them up separately so, and then if they pass, then having those in a format that is proper to go on the ballot. Now, that is a question that clearly uh, Mr. Gates suggests has the potential for legal limitation not being possible, but he doesn't know at this time, but he did say it's labor intensive, time intensive, and maybe expensive. And so I'm hopeful we will have a conversation after this meeting so we can plumb the depths of what that actually means. Then I can uh, make the call of whether we want to um, make that happen. So yes, Bond Council can do the, the drafting work uh, in question. And and just to allay people, uh, we are, our contract with Bond Council works on a per issue basis, not on a per hour basis. So um, if they have to spend many hours on uh, an issue that doesn't change their fee. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move us on. Um, so first, um, from Ms. Alto, Mr. Wilbur, if you can please circulate the cost of breakdown for the public restrooms to all of the members, please. Yes, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you. Next, Mr. Dunbar. Uh, I'm not in the queue, Mr. Chair. Yeah, but uh, for the record, I think we need to state um, the, your comments. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. I think Mr. Welch and I were just having a little bit of dialogue around the porta potty question. Um, I, I am on the board of the Muldoon Farmers Market, and we rent a porta potty for every market. And um, they're, they're 
quite expensive, actually. Um, and I think the reason is in part because unlike a private work site where you can control who uses it, um, public porta potties, obviously, they they very quickly become damaged and full. And so they have to be hauled and cleaned and repaired very frequently. Frequently, So I, I, I think that over a relatively short time, you, you the costs start to rack up and, and it, um, you know, is an argument for why we would have a more public structure. Thank you. I'm sorry, more permanent structure. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the last slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Fire bond good, police bond good. Um, for the fire bond, we want to uh, replace the ladder truck. The chief has a schedule for all of her equipment on the uh, rate in which we want to replace this one. This one here would be for a ladder truck. This is just an example of one. I believe this one's at fire station 12. They, I think she has five of them around town. I'm not sure which one this ladder truck would replace. I think it's station three but um, we can verify that. And then she's got some facility improvements at the downtown fire station, fire station one. She wants to make some uh, adjustments and improvements to power. And then also some, uh, they, it's also where they clean their, uh, their uh, structural stuff that uh, has, that might have some hazardous uh, contaminant on it. And they clean that at fire station one and they need some, some drainage improvements to be done there. That's primarily what's going on. And I talked about the police bond. We've done this in the past. This $3.9 million would re um, replace about 65, uh, roughly 60 to 70, but we're estimating about 65 vehicles. At least these, again, would continue, I believe, to be the hybrids. Um, that's a fully loaded price uh, for each, each one of those. Um, and I think uh, Alan and his team over at Fleet Maintenance, obviously the ones that we bought, uh, we bonded for last year, those are hitting the streets this year. And so um, be good if we could uh, continue to support APD in a manner by uh, the vehicles. You know, it's a combination of them just having high mileage, but it's also a combination of, um, unfortunately, some folks, uh, they run into them. And so that's not good. Anyway, I think that's all I have on these, Mr. Chairman. We'll be glad to share you a lot of information. I guess, um, you know, before I close up, I just really want to appreciate the, you know, the departments did a lot of work and they actually, we had to make some hard choices about what we were going to put on this ballot. The ask was much bigger, but I think they really got it narrowed down to the things that they need and the time that they want it. And, you know, like Girdwood, we were able to make some adjustments where we really needed them. So that's what we had presented last week, uh, or as we, we, we introduced, and as Mr. Dean, as Mr. Gates mentioned, uh, we have a public hearing on the 26th and then approval of the measures. The calendar that we're working with is the calendar that um, Ms. Jones, the clerk's office has given us that we need to get them done, the ba all the ballot measures done in order to uh, prepare them to get them on the April 6th ballot. So that's uh, all that I, that's all that I have. Um, I think in your, uh, I know that we're running long on time, so I won't show it, but in the presentation, there should be a little clip of a, um, a YouTube video of the work, the 45 days it took to do the Northern Lights Boulevard uh, replacement culvert. So um, hopefully it shows up on your presentation. And when you get a moment, take a look at it. You can you can see kind of the, the great work that PM&E, our design firm CRW and our contractor Granite did on that particular job uh, to, to get work done. And so again, Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman and members of the assembly. I appreciate your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Wilbur. Uh, Mr. Dunbar? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Wilbur. Um, and I apologize if I missed this, but I, I, I think I um, was confused on a point. Uh, for some reason, I, I thought that the our original budget packet had the fleet ask from the police in next year, not this year, um, because they were doing the tech um, ballot measure this year instead. So was I mistaken there? And also, I mean, if not, it seems like there's an opportunity here to um, perhaps use bond funds for the uh, for the uh, body worn cameras. Um, if you know, if we now have those two different questions being debated. So can you speak to either of those? I can. Um, so. 
uh, you know, in the I think the reason that we put together the ballot measure for APDs, technology, and body cameras is, is frankly to get away from bonding for those types of facilities because the technology is changing so rapidly that um, we're at a point in time in that sort of portion of the APD business where we want to be able to get you know updates when they occur, when things break down, we can get them a quick turnover rather than have um, you know, parts and pieces of our technology portion of our business of one generation and the next piece being a multiple generations. We're basically um, doing it separately for a service. It's the same argument uh, that we asked the voters and they supported for the fire department. They had a, a bunch of their portion of their business that's technology related. It, you know, it, it goes out of date a little bit quicker rather than bonding for it in pieces. So the proposal was rather than bonding for a portion of that and then wait for it to go out of date and then bonding for it again, um, the administration put together that proposal for that for that ballot measure um, to sort of keep that portion of the APD business, their their laptops, their uh, uh, cameras and the, now the additional of the body cameras if the voters would approve that ballot measure. It, it's separate from a bond, but we purposely did them differently and separately for that reason. As far as this bond, it's really for the fleet and there is no other capital improvements or technology improvements included on it. So so I just so Mr. Wilbur, I just I just misread when we did our capital budget. I misread the year. I th this this is not new. We had approved this back in November. This bond for the fleet or is this something no. that's added? It's something that's added. You you did not misread it, Mr. Dunbar. When we approved the capital budget, we did not have the fleet in 2021. But since you've approved the capital budget, as I mentioned, that's one of the changes that the administration is proposing. So if you agree to that, then we would amend the CIP and put this project in 21, where previously um, it was not as you approved the 21 capital budget. So you did not misread it. We are making a change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slivka. I just want to reiterate what Mr. Wilbur said. The reason why the body cameras are in what we'll call the, the fire department like structure is because it's a lease that we can't actually bond for it. So it has to be in that structure, which is why it is separate. Thank you. All right. Thanks again to uh, Mr. Wilbur for the presentation. Uh, if members have any questions, please uh, work offline with the administration. Uh, otherwise, uh, let's make sure we are ready to vote on the 26th. Thanks, everyone. I'll go ahead and close this work session. Thank you, everyone.